Gracious God, we humbly come before you on behalf of the people called Nazarene, from north and south, from the east and the west, across Canada and the USA. Heavenly Father, we ask for your protection. Be our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. You have promised to preserve this simple. Protect your church, we pray. Lord Jesus, we ask for your revelation. Illuminate your word among your churches. Inhabit our praises. May your glory descend on your people, that we may marvel at your deeds and proclaim your majesty throughout our lands. Reveal yourself anew. Revive us, we pray. In Holy Spirit, we ask for your guidance. We consecrate ourselves to you that you may lead us into your good, pleasing, and perfect will. You are our counselor, our comforter, our advocate, our helper. Lead us into your vision, your ways, your work. Guide us, we pray. For these three things we ask you, protection, revelation, guidance. We humble ourselves. Even as our Lord taught us to pray, we pray that your kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. Y perdona nuestras deudas como también nosotros hemos perdonado a nuestros deudores. Nous te demandons de ne pas nous soumettre à la tentation, mais à nous délivrer de mal. For yours is the glory, the power, and the honor. Nós buscamos o Senhor com todo o nosso coração. Santo Deus, traz reavivamento à tua igreja do Nazareno. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Something you probably expect on a Sunday morning. You thought, man, that sounds like some ghetto blasting music coming out of a car stereo. I like to use the word ghetto blasting as much as I can on a Sunday morning because I don't get to use that very often. But it's a little jarring, isn't it? It's a little jarring. If you heard that cranked up real loud outside your house, you'd be like, who's there? Who there? Who's coming to my door? <laughs> it's a little jarring. So is our sermon series this month. It's called Dangerous Prayers. Dangerous Prayers. And these sermons, I think, are going to jar us a little bit. It's going to be something that's going to break us out of our norm. It's going to be something that's going to shake us up a little bit. It's going to make us look at our spiritual door and say, who's there? Just like that. Amen. You guys ready for that this morning? Amen. Amen. Okay. So here's my first question to all of you good Nazarenes this morning. How many of you believe in the power of prayer? Raise your hand this morning. Amen. Woo! Woo! Amen. 
Amen. I think I see almost all the hands this morning up. Amen. How many of you would say that you would like to probably pray more often in your life? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Okay, that's good. Now, how many of you probably don't pray as much as you should? Raise your hand. <laughs> Amen. Amen. This is the greatest quiz ever. I just got a whole demographic of all sorts of things. This is great. Barna will probably be here next week, so take note. Okay. So, in our prayer life, sometimes we think that we're not very good at it at times, especially when we start out and we're new in the faith. Maybe some of us have been in the faith for a while, or we've heard about the faith, and, and but yet we just feel like we lack in prayer for one reason or another, and oftentimes it can be we just we just don't feel good at it. I mean, I remember going to chapel and hearing Pastor Waldo pray, and he was like a six foot two tall kind of guy, and he just, man, he was a Baptist guy, and he'd just pray, and I think everything was covered in the blood of Jesus by the end of the prayer. I mean, the kids in the school, the hallways, the water fountain that went out every other Tuesday, it was all covered in the blood of Jesus. He was just powerful in his prayers. And I think sometimes, like, when we listen to people pray, it's like we give them bonus points in our mind. Like, oh, that's so good. Man, that guy, he just bound the devil in his prayer. Give him 10 prayer bonus points. Woo! He's talking about the blood of Jesus all over. Woo! Give him some more bonus points. Then you got this person. Amen. 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 You got the other person. Amen. 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 And you got the women. Oh, it is, that's some good prayer meetings. Amen. 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 <laughs> but sometimes and I don't know about you um, I've often felt like a prayer failure at times and let, let me just explain what that is like I've been in a prayer meeting and I know I was praying and I know you shouldn't do this but I do this every once in a while I'll open up my eyes and then I'll see who's falling asleep and I feel like a prayer failure because now I've just bored them into the presence of God instead of bring them into the presence of God. And so I don't know about you, but sometimes when we pray, we can often feel like a failure. And, and let me just say this. God hears your prayers. The person next to you who's sleeping may not hear your prayers, but the God who is on the throne in heaven hears your prayers. Give him praise for that. Amen. And so, I don't know about you either, but sometimes we, we get into a habit, and it's not that God doesn't want to answer these prayers, but sometimes what we do is we, we pray safe prayers, especially if we're in a group and we're gathering with people, and we don't know if they're sprinkling the blood on everything or if they're just going to sit there and snore. We don't know. So we pray safe prayers. So we pray stuff like, God, be with us. That's, that's still a good prayer. Or we pray something like, protect me, Lord. And it's not that God doesn't want to do that. But we'll pray sometimes, bless us. And then sometimes you go to the prayer charismatic churches, you know, it's like, bless me with the Cadillac and some money and all. I don't know whatever goes on there. But they pray prayers <laughs> where they're really trying to pull down, I think, material things from heaven. <laughs> all right. But today and for this month, I'm not talking about safe prayers. Because just like the music that we heard, this is something that should be jarring a little bit to us. It should be something that puts us on the edge. It should be something that makes us look out our door and say, who dare? Dangerous prayers. Because I don't know about you, but being a Jesus follower is not always safe. In fact, I don't think being a Jesus follower is ever safe. Can anyone testify to that this morning just by raising your hand? Being a Jesus follower is not always safe. And so today within our scripture, we're going to look at a story in Acts 4. And uh, as we look at that this morning, I'm going to give you a little bit of context and we're going to read this today. But in Acts 4, we have Peter and John, the disciples of Jesus. And of course, they're out preaching Nothing other than Jesus. Woo, give them praise for that. They're preaching Jesus. What are they preaching? 
Let's stand this morning and let's read what they were preaching. This is from Acts chapter 4, and I believe this is verse 10. This is what it says. It says, let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. <clears throat> I wanted to throw that in today for prayer mobilization. Whose church is, uh, is it in the Nazarene? It's Jesus' church because he is the Nazarene. And so it says the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. Amen. 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 Let's bow our heads today. Dear Heavenly Father, as we go into this series and we go into our uh, mode of being mobilized to pray, uh, Lord, I'm just asking that you mobilize us to be used for you and your glory and your renown. Father, we pray for the three things that's been mentioned of protection. Lord, we pray that you help protect us in a way that will embolden us to live the faith. God, I pray for your direction. You direct us how to pray these prayers today. And that, Lord, you give us a fresh revelation of how these prayers can work within our lives. I pray for this word, and I pray, Lord, that the words that I speak today be your words and not mine. I pray this in the name of Jesus. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. You guys may be seated this morning. This is the message that the disciples were preaching. And so if anyone ever asks you, well, what do I say about Jesus when someone asks me about Jesus? You say what? this text says. You say, I am here because of the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man that you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. That's the gospel in a nutshell. And this is what they were preaching. They were preaching that Christ was raised from the dead. And here in Acts chapter 4, a miracle happened. There was a healing that took place of a man. He couldn't walk for 40 years. And he began to be healed when the disciples began to pray. Which was interesting because the setting that it was backdropped against was those of the priests and the Sadducees. And there was also the captain of the temple guard. And all of these people were furious. They were thinking that these guys belonged to a cult. That they did not belong to the establishment of the temple. And that these guys were preaching a false word. And so Peter and John the next day went into a trial that was before the Sanhedrin. But by whose authority on this verse did they come into the presence of the Sanhedrin. Whose authority? What's it say? It says the powerful. Say that with me, church. Say the powerful, the powerful. Name, name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. That's whose authority that they were coming into. They were not coming into the authority of the Sanhedrin based on the Sanhedrin. They were not coming into the authority of the priest because the priest asked them to come. They were there because of the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Give a praise for that, church. And you see, they were there because they were emboldened to be there. The name of the sermon title today and the prayer that is very dangerous but very impactful is three words. Say it with me. Make, Make me, me bold. bold. Make, Make me bold. This is a dangerous and jarring prayer to you and to the people around you. Woo! Because God Loves it when he hears this prayer. Make me bold. That's what happened here in Acts. These guys were bolded. You see, to give you another bit of context, 
the Sadducees were this group of religious people, and they did not believe that God could do anything to resurrect any sort of body. It's part of their core belief. And so then you got these two guys coming in, healing somebody, preaching in the name of Jesus, saying that it's this man that you crucified, but whom God did what? Raised from the dead. I put the answer on the screen. I really tried to make that easy for you guys this morning. God raised from the dead. God raised from the dead. This is what Jesus did. Let's go to verse 13. And then it says, it says, the members of the council were amazed. Somebody say amazed. amazed. They were amazed when they saw, this is where the word comes in, the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. How many of you have special training in the scriptures? How many of you don't? Okay, look, you're perfect for this, okay? All right. It says they were ordinary people, ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. This is powerful. So when you look at how this is written in the text, there's a word called idiotech or idiotex. And it basically means... Idiots. Idiots. They were amazed when they saw the boldness of these idiots. <laughs> For they could see that they were ordinary men that were idiots in the scriptures. Now, I'm not going to ask if you think that you're an idiot. But I find it amazing. That these two men were emboldened to preach, to teach, and they, they had a healing service by the emboldenment that they had within their lives. And here's the other thing. So were these guys. They were amazed. And so there's kind of a dilemma there, though. You know, this guy got healed. That's the dilemma. You know, standing there. And yet you got these other guys on the other side. They're like, stop these guys. They're a threat. Don't let them talk. Don't let them do anything else. Try to wrap them up. We don't need to hear anything about this. We don't believe that the you know, the dead can be resurrected. This is crazy. Get them out of here. Woo. Something like that. A little less calm. I don't know. Something. But basically they were saying, we don't want these guys to preach. But yet... They prayed. And it's interesting that when they prayed their prayer, it didn't keep them safe, did it? It didn't keep them safe. What happened to these guys? Well, to summarize it, these guys got beat, put in prison. And not to give away too much of the story, but they ended up in a at the end of their life, they didn't end up probably the way that you would think they, they would. They didn't pray a prayer. Oh, Lord, here we are. Don't let anything bad happen to us today. They didn't pray that prayer. Verse 29. It says this. It says, and now, O oh Lord, hear their threats. And give us, your servants, you want to talk about a bold prayer, give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. That's what they prayed. They didn't pray, Lord, keep me safe. Lord, help me. Look good while I present your gospel. Lord. <laughs> they didn't pray stuff like they prayed a dangerous prayer and that was jarring and that was difficult. And why would they pray something like that? It's
It's more than just being a Jesus follower. It's why they prayed this prayer. Because Jesus has a lot of followers. <laughs> but what makes someone go into this mode where they become emboldened to do something that's out of their comfort zone and out of their normal? I believe it's because they had unshakable, someone say unshakable. Unshakable. Unshakable spiritual convictions. They were convicted by the Holy Spirit to take this good word and gospel to as many people as possible. And here's the interesting thing about that spiritual urgency to obey, no matter what the cost, is going to be amazing in your life. It may not feel amazing, nor look amazing, but people will be amazed because of how you have placed your life and you have aligned your will with the will of God to come together and have an unshakable spiritual conviction to break out of the normal. Yeah. To break out of the normal. That's what happened to these guys. I wonder... What kind of urgency do we have in our day today? What kind of urgency do we have to talk about the gospel to people? I mean, I could come up here and preach a million sermons on it, but it does me no good when we don't have the urgency within ourselves to want to be emboldened to take the gospel to somebody else. Amen. So, of course, we're going to do a quiz. I love quizzes. This is for you. You don't have to raise your hand. If you do, it's on your own terms, okay? I'm just saying. Okay. How many of you would rate your boldness on a scale of 1 to 10? 1 being, eh, I don't think so. I don't think I'm going to do that. And a 10 being, I am so on fire. I ain't going to let anything. I ain't going to let anything get me down. On a 1 to 10, what is the scale of your boldness in your life? Take inventory of that. I don't need to know because guess what? God does. He already knows. And what he wants to do within us today, I believe, is to help us become emboldened. As we begin this series on dangerous prayers, as we begin this series on praying for things that break through the norm, he wants to be have us become emboldened by a spirit. There is a lot of Christians that will say with their mouth that they're 10, but with their actions and their lives, maybe become more like a one. And so my question to you is, in the biblical sense, sometimes we think that boldness is some sort of personality trait. Well, I can't be bold because I'm an introvert. Guess what? Your pastor's an introvert. Yeah. And that will probably shock you. But it's not a personality trait thing. Boldness is a gift from the Lord. It breaks through the normality we have within our lives. It can break through timidness. It breaks through introvertedness. It breaks through our hesitancy. Oh, I don't know if I should talk to that person. They're going to call me a name that I don't like, and I don't like that. Myself. Mm -hmm. My ego is very fragile. <clears throat> it happens. But here's the thing. When God, through his Holy Spirit, gives us the empowerment to be emboldened for his gospel, he doesn't give you, he makes you this. He helps make you outspoken and confident, not in yourself, but confident in who he is. He helps shrink back the spiritual opposition to give you a place and a room at the table to where you're able to bring the word to the people who need it most. But it comes through a line and a life of prayer because the disciples didn't do anything in their own name. They always did things in the name of Jesus and they did that when they were able to pray. What kind of things can we do within our church when we come together and pray for things in the name of Jesus, church? Amen? Amen. Amen. 
Amen. Now, let's go to verse 29 through 31. It says this in the scriptures. It says, and now, O Lord, hear, hear their threats. Give us your servants. What? Great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. Woo! We need that. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Give God praise. We need that in our world today. And then it said, after this, the, after this prayer, it says the meeting place shook. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they preached the word of God with what word? How did they preach it? What? I didn't hear you. Here, say it again. I'm, I'm a little hard of hearing Boldness. 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 God, make me bold. It's not like, Lord, help me go out and try for the boldness team. I think I can do it this year. I've really been practicing hard. I've got my boldness shirt on. I'm going to be, I think I'm going to be in the team this year. No, it's not just something we try. It's something that we can do through the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes I think there's this perception, you know, of when the preacher prepares the message, he's got like his, his preparation music. You know, if it was a sports event, you know how every sports team has like a sports theme song of sort that they walk out to or something like that. And sometimes I wonder, maybe I should do that for Sunday mornings. And instead of we will rock you, it would be we will rock you for Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Because boldness, boldness is something I believe God wants to fill our lives with. He definitely wants us to be bold. He wants us to live in boldness. What does that mean with our world today? It means all kinds of things. It means that the way we dress, we can dress modestly and that be a statement of boldness to the world because we're not conforming to the way the world wants us to be. We're conforming to what God wants us to be. It means being bold doesn't mean you hook up with every single person that you see. Being bold means that you can read your Bible at work and you're not going to care whether you get fired or not. Being bold means you're going to listen to Christian music when you're coming in to work and when you're going into school and you're not going to care what other people are saying. Being bold means that you move when the Spirit leads you to move to talk to somebody. It might be at the Speedway. It might be at Walmart. It might be at Wendy's. It might be a stranger and you don't know anything about this person. But then you get that little chat and says, I think you need to talk to that person. That is being bold in our world today. Being bold is confessing sin and being able to live a life that is holy and pleasing unto the Lord. You want to talk about being bold? It's being bold. Being bold is giving. Giving unto the Lord, giving to others. Being bold. And so, my next verse, I want to look at Acts chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. Being bold. The way that these apostles were. This is where they ended up. It says that they arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But an angel of the Lord came at night, opened the gates of the jail, and brought them out. And he told them, go to the temple and give the people this message of life. How many of you, just raise of hands, would be emboldened by seeing the angel and getting you out of jail and prison? And you'd be ready to take that next step of boldness and go talk to them people again. Amen? Amen. Yeah, let's give God some praise for that. Sometimes giving praise is a sign of being bold. And it's true. Because God wants to break through all sorts of things in our lives. Real quick. Real quick three points about attributes of being bold. Boldness always, almost always, triggers spiritual opposition. Almost always. So in this verse that I just read, the first part, it says that they arrested the apostles and put them in what? 
Put him in jail. Woo. I would say, raise of hands, how many of you want to go to jail? <laughs> I think I know. And here's the interesting thing in the story. This is their second time in jail for the week. You think that that's about your prodigal son or daughter that's been going into jail so much. This is the apostles. They went to jail twice in the same week. Someone would say, well, where is God in all of that? Why, why, why didn't he just put him in a nice place in a church and they could meet and greet at the door? Something like that. It's because it wasn't his will. You see, when we face opposition, we have to understand that opposition often comes because of our obedience to the Lord. Opposition, obedience, almost go together. And it's a strange, it's a strange bedfellow of the two ideas. But when you become on fire for the Lord and you want to live your life in direct and, and obedience and you want to live your life in such a way to where you want nothing else that matters, nothing but Jesus in your life, much like the song we sing, let it be Jesus. Then when you let that song become your life song, guess what? Opposition is around the corner. Opposition will always be around the corner. And if you're not ready to face opposition, you may not be ready to be used by God. And that's a prayer that you're going to need to pray. If you're not ready for opposition, you may not be ready to be used by God. Because boldness, my quick second point, boldness often releases God's miracles. How many of you want a miracle in your life? You want to see a miracle. You want to be able to pray in such a way. Amen. Give God praise. You want to pray in such a way. You might see an angel come down and open some gates. Break you out of jail. Now, here in the book of Acts, Luke didn't make a big deal out of the angel. He's just like writing it like it's no big deal. It's just, yeah, it's just another part of the story. Here we go. He didn't sit on the details of that. He didn't say, and the angel was shining bright and was glorious and was singing hallelujah and way maker, miracle work. He, he didn't write any of that. But it's like Luke wasn't surprised. And neither should we be when we begin to pray and we ask for God to work and move. When we ask to be emboldened. Because when you walk in obedience to God, guess what? You're not going to be surprised that a miracle is going on in here. And then another miracle over here. Oh, guess what? God's working in there and he's working over here. You're not surprised because you already know where the power came from. Give him praise this morning. Woo! <laughs> Lastly, boldness always requires faith. Always requires faith. We look at verses 20 through 21 in chapter 5. It says this. It says, go to the temple and give the people this message of life. This message of life. This message that is going to be jarring. It's going to be different. It's going to make people look outside and be like, what's going on? This message. And it says, at the daybreak, the apostles entered the temple as they were told. And immediately began teaching. They didn't hesitate. You see, God wants us to go do what he tells us to do. And he doesn't care about the circumstances that may surround him because he knows that he can help bring us into the positioning and platforms that we need to be. Go do this. But what? How hard would that be for us to go do and to get arrested again? We didn't like going to jail the first time, let alone the second time. Here's the thing, we have no idea what God may set in motion when we have a single act of obedience in our life. Amen? Amen. Amen. We have no idea. We have no idea. Now, just to summarize it for you, after all this happened, of course, you know, the disciples, 
you know, they lived a pretty good life. They had a nice retirement in 401k. They were able to go and fish all that they wanted to in their retirement. And then they had this really nice church where they meet and greeted all the time. And they didn't have to really do a whole lot because, you know, that they had already did so much. And so, like, you know, God had just given them this wonderful, faithful life and that they were blessed and that they became, you know, just these glorious beings in heaven to greet you now at the doors and the gates of heaven. You guys believe me, right? <laughs> Everything I just told you, that was not true. <laughs> what happened to these guys? Let me tell you what happened to these guys. The Apostle John, the one who the disciple Jesus loved, talk about that. He ended up being boiled in oil. He ended up getting sent to this island called Patmos where he lived a solitary life and where he died on that island alone. He didn't even have a soccer ball called Wilson to have a friend with. <laughs> and of course, there's Peter. Well, you think Peter would end up with the 401k from the you know Catholic Church because he's the first pope. Uh, but that didn't happen. That didn't happen to Peter. What happened to Peter? Let's see, he became martyr in Rome. And he had the same style of crucifixion that our Lord and Savior also went through. But he didn't, he didn't do it the same way as Jesus did because he says, how can I die the same death as my Lord? And so what they did is they crucified him upside down. Boldness always comes with opposition. Boldness is not a guarantee that your life is going to end up the way that you want it to. And here's the thing about all of that, because if you're facing opposition right now, how many of you might be facing something in your life that's bigger than you? You're facing some sort of opposition and you're, and you're doing right. Here's the thing. Opposition in this life, it may win, but there's another life to come. And your emboldness will speak to those that even come after you. And I guarantee you that when you're before the very presence of God, it's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. Boldness is what the church needs. It is. When you ask for anything in the church, we always think of like, well, if we had this, we'll be further along with this. If we just had this resource or that resource. No, what the church needs is to be bold. To get out of our comfort zone. We need to be emboldened. We need to believe. I think that we lost sometimes our sense of belief. I think that the church just likes being comfortable. We like just getting our little bulletin, singing a few songs, and then we go to the buffet, and then we complain about bad service and having a terrible day. We forget everything that we even learned in church. We need to become emboldened. Emboldened for the gospel. Emboldened for the message of the cross. Emboldened for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ emboldened to say no to sin, to say yes to God, emboldened, emboldened to love, emboldened to be merciful, emboldened to be forgiving, emboldened to make a difference in our lives and those around us, to glorify God. Let me just say it this way. You're never going to fulfill your calling of what God wants you to do in your life in the comfort zone. You're never going to fulfill it. And so I think today, and I know it's been a little longer service, and I know I see the droopy eyes, and the hungry faces. I get it. We're all human. But I am going to ask us that we stand this morning. Because today I want us to pray for being bold. 
So for those who are gathered today who are able to stand, I want us to bow our heads and pray today. Dear Jesus, Lord, as I hear this message today about being emboldened, God, maybe I don't even know what that means for my life. But I believe, as I pray, that you know what that means. And so, Lord, I lay myself before you. And I pray these three words. Make me bold. Make me bold. Lord, this is a prayer that I know you love to answer. Because it's a prayer you've answered in your word and scripture through, through things we've seen with the apostles. I know that this is a prayer, a dangerous prayer. But it's dangerous because I know the enemy is ready to trap them in sin and to devour those who he may. But on this prayer mobilization day, we pray for boldness because that's what it's going to take to be able to come together and make this month of prayer work. We need to have an urgency. We need to have a desire. We need to be able to come together, Lord, today and pray for your will, not mine, to pray that this church, the church of the Nazarene, the church that is Jesus' church, that this church within our next few days be emboldened to be a witness for your gospel. Lord, use this place here. And Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus, all God's people said, Amen. 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 If you prayed that prayer, give him praise today. Give him praise. That's a powerful and dangerous prayer. You never know what a little act of obedience may do to unleash the boldness of God in your life. Amen. Amen. May you bless the Lord today. You guys are dismissed.